Welcome back. We will discuss what is happening in DeFi, what's going on. We will explore together why DeFi is a paradigm shift in the financial industry as we know it today. All right, guys, and uh, welcome back at uh, at On DeFi. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, speak today to Ta Talal from Dubai. And uh, Talal is uh, from the Jibril Network, and they're working on a project called Trench Finance. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the episode will be all about today about real world assets on the blockchain, fixed interest rates, and uh, how Trench Finance is tackling this uh, this new complex space. So Tal, who, who are you and uh, why are you uh, so excited about uh, Trench Finance and Slice? Great. Well, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, basically, I've been um, working on products on Ethereum for the past uh, three, four years. Initially, we started off with asset tokenization. Uh, so I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of a Swiss blockchain development company called Gibral. Uh, we experimented a lot with moving traditional financial assets on chain. Uh, if you think of like what the the use cases were for for uh, building stuff on Ethereum or or the use of smart contracts in general, a lot of it applies to uh, the traditional world. So, for example, your bonds, your equities, your cash, real estate. Uh, so we thought that uh, basically those asset classes can improve significantly by being represented in in, in tokenized format. Um, so we we um, we started off by working with traditional financial institutions, so regulated banks, central banks, uh, real estate development companies, to move their assets on chain. Um, mm -hmm. And we did several successful POCs. Uh, but to be completely honest, on the crypto industry in general, none of the companies that were doing asset tokenization have found good product market fit. And the reason why I believe that is. Uh, even though the operational efficiencies of moving assets on chain is insane, the perceived technological risk from traditional players outweighs the improvement in efficiency. So, for example, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a pretty cool thing that we did and, and uh, with, with a regulated bank here in, in Abu Dhabi uh, is we did the world's first Sukuk transaction. Sukuk is Islamic version of a bond. Uh, we did that on public net Ethereum with a, with a government-owned bank in, in Abu Dhabi. And mm -hmm. once that project was finished, uh, they basically told us that uh, moving it on chain improved their operating costs by 95%, which is insane. But the risk and compliance department basically said that the number of approvals they would need to get to do this on chain, whether it's from the rating agencies, whether it's from the regulators, uh, would basically make it not worthwhile doing a, on a, on a full blown commercial scale, because mm. a, as you know, with like fixed income uh, issuances are usually 500 million, 1 billion. Uh, so basically the, the, the tech uh, potential risk or perceived risk uh, kind of outweighs the, the, the operational efficiency. So as a company that does asset tokenization, we looked at all asset classes on the cash or fiat side. We did a project with the Central Bank of Jordan uh, to move their uh, fiat currency on chain. That was done in a proof of concept format. Uh, we also did uh, legally enforceable digital securities. So representing uh, uh, shares within an SPV on the Ethereum blockchain. But mm -hmm. as you can see now, we're, we're building tranche because the idea of getting traditional financial institutions to move on chain, uh, really the product market fit wasn't there. So. What we believe will happen is uh, traditional, as traditional financial companies will come and use stuff that's on-chain after it's proven and tested. So something like Compound, for example, which has over 10 billion in total value locked and people use it every day. I can foresee in the near future banks and traditional institutions coming and utilizing these de decentralized money markets um, for themselves. Uh, so plugging into punk compound, plugging into curve, hopefully plugging into tranche as well. <clears throat> yeah, that's very interesting. And what I <clears throat> what I also saw actually today, there's this ZK International Group, uh, a Nasdaq listed company that is now like it's a Chinese company that builds like water wells and other of like real world things, and they're listed on Nasdaq. They are also um, 
building like their own decks and, and you see a lot of these companies trying to build their own DeFi infrastructure to list their own products not realizing that we're talking here about the democratization of finance so um it's the protocols that i think that are now building uh, that will lead uh, the lego block revolution or the democratization so i think that uh basically what what gibral uh, your your early your your basically your mother your your developer company is doing it's just like trench is just a dao uh it's just a set of smart contracts that's deployed by a group of people and gibral is just you know like the main like a developer also on that um that is how these things will evolve. Like it's not like one central Nasdaq listed company that will have the biggest DAX or something. And I think this is a lot of companies are very afraid to to let that uh, to let that go. Right, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we've seen this trend with Bitcoin, right? If you look at the bank stance on Bitcoin, they were essentially saying, "Yeah, it's not going to work. It's not going to work." And then now they have started to embrace it. Uh, because they, they, they have no yes, real yeah. other option. Uh, and I think we'll see the same with DeFi. Uh, banks, uh, uh, centralized repositories, like, uh, for example, the Bank for International Settlement. You, don't know, you know that meme about the guy that's, that's pretty uh, heavy. Uh, there's always a meme about his jacket, about uh, jacket button about to pop off. Uh, yeah. It's called the Bank for International Settlement. They're saying that they're going to move stuff on chain. Like, for me, that just makes absolutely no sense, right? If it's a bank for international settlement, the blockchain already does, the public chain already does the settlement. So there's no need for that institution completely. Um, so yeah, we, we always talk about this intermediation, removing the intermediaries. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think you'll be able to remove them completely, but you'll be able to remove the ones that sit in the middle and literally don't do anything. like. You will still need to go with. You still need to deal with some type of interface. You will need something to go from crypto to fiat. But some of the functionalities, like settlement, clearing, uh, registrar, like centralized security depositories, those won't be needed anymore, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I think uh, uh, let's see what is his name again uh, of this. Uh, yeah, Aug Augustinus Karstens something like that he's like yeah google him you will see he's it's 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 almost too funny to be true but he's this typical yeah banker guy that literally is one of the fattest people that can still walk that i have seen in my life right it's just it's just very funny but you know he's not he's he's a, i think you know he's a, he's a pretty uh smart guy probably but uh i mean when, when you look at uh, yeah it's 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 just pretty funny and they, they want to this immediate they want to be in the middle because they say there needs to be a trusted settler in this process and i think we the blockchain is basically this intermediating this settlement layer and that is just very hard for compliance officers officers or it departments to understand so i think we need also like a big cultural shift uh in these companies to happen and that will take many years uh and many like proof concepts and many adoption to for people to fully understand this i i think yesterday uh jerome paul actually said that bitcoin is a speculative asset okay yeah i agree but he said like it's 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 similar to gold right he literally said that in his speech yesterday so this is like it's big win uh, and i think this is also like it's not a question anymore of when do we see projects like gibberal or like you know like trench finance uh, becoming more and more adopted throughout different supply chains where we're, we're going to talk about uh in a bit uh i think it's it's inevitable that that will happen yeah so um yeah so we real world assets on chain and we talked about that and uh, it will be huge um we're, we're gonna talk about some more in-depth examples of this after we zoom a little bit into trench finance so Maybe you can explain a little bit what what is trench uh, finance and what do you what do you guys uh, are are doing? Yeah, so basically with trench.finance, it's a decentralized protocol for managing risk. Uh, last year we realized that uh, there's there's a very big market gap in basically mm -hmm. being able to manage your risk on chain. 
now, now in hindsight, it uh, our our thought process was validated because now you have Barnbridge, Opium, Saffron. Many many different projects are uh, more or less doing uh, something similar to what what we're trying to do as well, and that basically mm -hmm. is. Uh, your ability to, um, in traditional finance, there's many different tools that allow you to hedge, that allow you to manage risk from the same bucket of underlying assets. So, for example, if you're familiar with collateralized debt obligations, uh, yeah. with CDOs, you are basically able to uh, uh, prioritize cash flows so that you create a very safe instrument, even if all the underlying assets are... Uh, semi-safe or, or C-rated, for example. Uh, and that's because the double A or the, the top-rated instrument is the one that pays out the interest first. Um, mm -hmm. The reality is the process in the real world is so messed up and involves so many intermediaries that it is a perfect use case for uh, smart contracts and programmatic cash flow. So at Tranche, basically, we develop tools that allow you to manage your risk on-chain. And we're starting off with... Uh, focus on on capital markets, so fixed and variable in, variable rate instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so to to simplify it, today you have Dai, all right? You have um, Dai, and you want to earn interest on that Dai. If mm -hmm. you come to Tranche, you'll be able to deposit it either into Tranche A, which is a guaranteed four uh, percent fixed uh, fixed rate of return, or you put it into Rate B if you want to speculate on the returns. And the way, uh, the way that tranche B's interest is calculated, it's basically the total protocol yield minus the uh, fixed rate instrument, which is the 4% that we talked about, would end up with a variable rate. Uh, because the, the reality is today, Compound, Aave, uh, most of the decentralized money markets involve variable rate instruments. Uh, which which can be fine for someone like me that that doesn't care if I'm making three or eight uh, percent on a given day, uh, but for this to to actually eat up trade finance, you need to have some type of uh, method where you uh, can lock in rates. Yeah, and that will be huge. Yeah, like so. Also, um, at, at DeFi Capital, we're also working on a stability fund. And we will uh, most likely also use uh, tranche finance and uh, other, you know, protocols. And we would leverage a couple of these protocols because you want to get like, what is the best rate? What I find hard to grasp, there is, I forgot the name of, the, of it, but there's now a lot of like fixed interest rates, uh, DAOs. And it's, it's, it's because I think it will become a new uh, trend in, in DeFi. Um, but some of them pay like a fixed 20% interest rate if you lock it for a year. I think that is a little bit unsustainable. Uh, and they don't show the proof to me that the other side is also bought. Like what I like about Trench, you can inspect that if you deposit what, what I saw, right? So if you deposit, let's say, uh, 100,000 or a million die, right? Or 10,000, whatever, right? Then you can actually inspect on chain that the other side of the bet is actually bought over, right? So you're 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 kind of sure. And when that did, didn't happen yet, then uh, uh, at some point the DAO will take it over. Somebody somebody will come, right? And if nobody comes, you just you need to lower your 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 expectations, right? Exactly. Um, so this is this is it's 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 a very interesting point that you raise there. Um, and that's something that differentiates DeFi protocols from something like Celsius or BlockFi, where you have to uh, trust a black box, an institution that basically uh, borrows and lends without you knowing if it's 100% back. So in, in my yeah. opinion, it is absolutely critical that uh, you don't trust, but you verify. Uh, and that's something that we've, we've put on the core of, of tranche.finance. And that's... Start starting off with our staking product, um, which basically is created to really reward uh, early users and to reward liquidity providers on Uniswap because we're we're interested in improving the liquidity of uh, Slice on the ETH and Dai pair on Uniswap. Yeah. Before we dive into that, uh, maybe we could get a step back. I will I will share my uh, share my screen and uh, because. Uh, and this is no F financial advisor, just scrolling through the projects. Uh, what I like about your your flow and your team is, so you basically started with Jibril, some other company, and you first had also this 
a token for this, but it's it was hard to find like a good use case. Now what you did, you did a swap as, as far. Maybe you can tell something about that. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, we started off in 2017. As I mentioned, we targeted the asset tokenization use case. And mm -hmm. as described in our white paper, there was a clear use for the Gibral network token within those products. What we realized is that the banks, the central bank that we worked with, the real estate companies, they wanted to test out the tokenized assets, but they didn't want to touch the utility tokens. And mm -hmm. since we created Gibral and ICO to drive sustainable demand to the token, we had to pivot. All right. So we, we had to uh, pivot. And our initial token, JNT, was designed in a way that was, first of all, very heavy. It was a compilation of several different contracts. And it mm -hmm. included many centralized functionalities, like right yeah. to freeze, right to seize, forced transfers. All of these are very appealing for institutions but this wouldn't work in the DeFi space. So uh, plus the token was upgradable, which meant the development team could change the code of the token over time. So basically what we did, so we said, okay, you know what? We are pivoting into DeFi. So we need to have a token that actually works for DeFi protocols. So we did a, a reverse swap of every 10 JNT received one slice. Uh, the swap was, uh, airdrop to everyone's Ethereum's wa Ethereum wallets. And mm -hmm. we had support by two exchanges, gate.io and Bitrex. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you had your tokens there, you would have automatically received your slice. And yeah. we added a couple of things that are uh, DeFi focused, like your ability to delegate your votes, for example. Uh, so yeah, three, three main reasons. First, to go to a decentralized token that doesn't have centralized functionalities. Second, a lighter one because gas fees uh, can be a pain. Uh, and third is your ability to delegate your votes. So yeah, that that, that basically describes our, our airdrop. That is really cool. And and uh, to, to simplify it, it's just like you pivoted. And I, I believe as also as an investor and as a, uh, a researcher in space, like companies that are able to make these pivots will uh, are be, are just like DeFi are more anti-fragile. So are much, you, you, you grew a lot. You have a lot of knowledge in the space already. Uh, comparable to just like a starting team that maybe built their first project. It's it's better to uh, follow projects that maybe already went to a bear market or already uh, went to some you know some uh, turbulence in in their in their uh, you know that that makes you only stronger. And I think it's really cool that you guys uh, did that. Um, yeah. So this is the website. I would recommend uh, everybody to to visit it. And basically, if we go to your uh, documentation we can inspect all the different uh, the trench DAO, the treasury etc but i think what is important to talk about is the value accrual mechanism for the trench token so why would the trench token make sense in the setup and uh how can this this DAO uh concept actually potentially uh how can this potentially grow right yeah um, yeah. So, so this is this is something that uh, is obviously a work in progress, similar to many things in, in in DeFi. But basically, the way that it works is on the left side here, you have the operating product. So the tranche product that I mentioned that has a fixed and variable rate instrument. That's what we refer to as compound, and we also have a peer to peer uh, loan product. Any fees that are generated from those products are generated either in Ethereum or in Dai. That Ether and DAI is deposited into the tranche uh, fee collecting contract, which will become the tranche DAO. And then there's a perpetual method to buy back slice. So again, any fees generated from the protocol go towards the fee collector and it is used to buy back slice from Uniswap. So it's like a continuous buyback. And then this is where the staking comes in. Uh, Using the slice that was bought back from the market, we incentivize uh, users to do specific actions. So now we can look at, at, at staking and see what actions we're currently incentivizing. Um, but one important point is that the, the, the slice uh, distributed to the incentives is not an inflationary supply. Like this, this is, I think, a very important distinction is if the product, if the coin's supply is not capped, that means you are printing new money, similar to the Federal Reserve, in order to uh, meet your current obligations or meet your current goals. Whereas we've done, what we've done in our case is we bought back 
uh, 3 million uh, slice tokens, so 15% of the supply, and we deposited it as a company into the fee collector, and that will be used to incentivize the users. So that's why you see some crazy APYs on, uh, on the tranche.finance staking app, but that's actually done uh, on, on purpose to kind of get people to, 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 to look into this. So uh, this top part, these three boxes relate to your staking and your wallet. The bottom part where it says current pools, this talks about the pools in general. So we have three different types of staking pools, each paying a different variable APY. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you look at the uh, slice pool, we have about a million deposited. And on a weekly basis, you have 10,000 slice being distributed. So that means uh, you take the total uh, slice rewards, which is 10,000 here, divided by the total number staked, annualized because the epoch duration is one week and that's how you get the variable apy so the more people stake the more this apy actually drops uh, because the reward is distributed across a larger number of users um, but yeah as you can see the the apy for slice eth is 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 still quite high and and that's because it, it has the highest uh, reward and that's mm -hmm. something related to uh, if you provide liquidity on Uniswap, you are taking on risk of impermanent loss, especially when you're doing it with Ether, because you don't really have that with DAI. Um, so, yeah, for, for that reason, you see a very high APY. So we're doing this for the first month. And then after the first month, uh, those epoch rewards will, will be adjusted accordingly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I also did a, <clears throat> another video some time ago on the, the Ivan on Tech channel about liquidity pools. They seem very complex and hard to understand, but it's actually a very simple curve, right? So it's a simple curve that if the price moves up like 30 or 40% or 30%, like you you will lose some, 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 uh, some assets, right? But because you have an API of 2,800%, it actually balances out that risk, right? Or even if it drops down. So because it's a high volatile asset, because it's still in high price discovery mode, uh, basically you're you're paying this amount. It's actually very similar if you would pay market makers. Let's say you're now listing on a centralized exchange. You also have these pay these market makers quite a lot of money if you're still a very uh, low liquid asset, right? Yeah. So yeah, I think I, it's very similar. I I agree. I agree. Look, I think that the reason why we had elected to, to do this staking is our first step was doing the token swap. As I mentioned earlier, it would have been difficult for us to, to, to get into the DeFi space with, the, with our previous token. Now we're doing staking. And then after that, we'll have the main tranche product out, which allows you to split any interest bearing instrument into a fixed income and variable uh, rate instrument yeah if you go to the using the app you'll you'll be able to see it uh yeah using the app or mechanism and calculation yeah so basically this is how it looks like it's currently being audited um so basically you'll be able to deposit die and select uh whether you want to receive a fixed rate or a variable rate return mm -hmm. um and yeah it's yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a it's a very exciting space to be honest so a lot of stuff is coming down the pipeline and what i what interests me the most, as people know, I am very uh, yeah, motivated by the reward assets on the blockchain because like, I mean, uh, yeah, it's nice uh, these, these, these APIs or these, you know, drops and the crypto market is a real market. So there's real liquidity. It's a real thing. It's, you know, generates a good niche financial market. But, you know, you are in Dubai, uh, you know, I'm the Netherlands. Like if we can have some trade, trade finance, supply chain finance, um, like so if we get some of the real world assets on chain, uh, yeah, it, it will be, it will explode in terms of like the, the amount of, uh, the amount of liquidity will, will explode and the underlying networks will become very valuable, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, at the moment, we're living in a world where we have uh, zero interest rates and, or negative interest rates, for example, where you live, right? In Europe, Switzerland, yeah. Japan, we actually have negative interest rates. So I think that uh, there will be a big hunt for yield. Uh, companies, anyone that traditionally had like the 60-40 portfolio of 60% fixed income and 40% equities, now crypto is has to be part of it. And I think that in the coming 
five years, you will see crypto fixed income or crypto capital markets also becoming a big part of it because it's uh, the yields will be better because you have less intermediaries cutting out of uh, the spread, basically, because you have borrower and lender. Like in, 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 if you think of a traditional job of a bank, it is to connect borrowers and lenders, except sure. that they do it in a very complex, expensive manner. Uh, so it's only natural that you have better yields on chain uh, in the long term. Yeah, something that I also wanted to talk about is like uh, capital efficiency, right? Or uh, capital, uh, yeah, capital efficiency and, 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 and the way that our current world is moving, right? I mean, Dubai is a good example of that. I, 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 I'm just back from Dubai. I also visited the, the Trans Finance uh, office. But if you look there, there's so much there's so much money in the world right now. And it, it seems that the banking sector right now is actually bigger than the actual sectors that are actually producing economic goods. And in my opinion, that is just a, a ticking time bomb. And also, if you look at like the, uh, yeah, the, the re return on, on capital, like a lot of money is just moving around from person to person. And it's very like in the traditional financial space where if you look at DeFi, it's just that we remove some of the middlemen that are taking so much rent, a lot of like rent, rent seeking people in, in these, all these value chains, we're remo removing them. We're making it much more efficient. So if you uh, actually provide liquidity to a uh, oil company or gas company with factories that wants to buy uh, some gas and that has some uh, risk involved in it. And if you then trench it, like you don't necessarily have to know so much about the deals that happen. But it's just that you that you know okay i i am providing some liquidity it's a little bit dangerous for me but you know i'm i'm willing to take take that risk not now you put all your money in a bank and then there's so much bureaucracy layers until you actually exactly when exactly the factory or the supply chain gets this money right and i think that is something that uh yeah we talked about this before but i think like once we see gas companies oil companies uh I was also recently talking to a, a, a mergers and acquisition uh, company, a pretty big one, and they were also exploring how to do credit lines and things like that. And I think that will, yeah, that will happen. That's some that will happen uh, for sure. What do you think I mean, about that? To to your point, I think there's something that uh, a statistic that actually blows my mind. Uh, there was a study by Yale, I believe, about the cost of financial intermediation. And over the past 100 years, the cost of in, uh, financial intermediation has been around 2% of the total value transacted, which, if you think about it, is insane. Because 100 years ago, we required uh, physical papers. We needed to mail stuff. So basically, what, 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 what we can tell is that the uh, improvements in efficiency and cost were not reflected into the pricing of those financial intermediaries. That's why... If you look at in the GCC, for example, the profitability of banks significantly uh, outperforms any other sector. And that's because uh, they have been able to abuse the position that they are in. Um, and I just, as you mentioned, that's a ticking time bomb. And slowly but surely, we'll see people moving to this new uh, economic paradigm that doesn't require uh, the same level of, of involvement from the traditional institutions. But I also think we see a lot of behavioral changes. Like for example, today salaries are paid or were paid on a monthly basis. You have monthly and quarterly closing. These are processes that have been there because of the limitations that we had in previous uh, institutions. Imagine I had to wire salaries every day. It would be a pain because you have an employee that needs to do that. Uh, you pay uh, wire fees, etc. But we've seen that, mm -hmm. that that today you can actually stream money, uh, whether on Ethereum or on Bitcoin. Um, and now with with Layer Two coming up, uh, and and be like a lot more consciousness on 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 gas prices. Uh, I personally think that gas prices is a short term pain, but it's actually reflective of the potential. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, like Google started off with, or sorry, Hotmail started off with a with a two megabyte email. Google came in and offered significantly more, and they took the bullet on on the costs. But they actually bet that online or or cloud storage costs would go down over time. 
And mm -hmm. I think that the Ethereum uh, industry or the Ethereum ecosystem is, is making the same bet. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's also, of course, a big question. Uh, now with the gas fees are a little bit high um, and it's it's a big pain. Like, so like, let's say you want to get this fixed interest rate, you have to pay some money for it. But, you know, let, let, from, from for example, a DeFi capital perspective, I would not really want to do this on, on a Binance Smart Chain or on any other chain. I would rather... You know, when the capital we move, if we, you know, we have a, a stability fund coming up and more information about this in a next uh, video, but uh, it, a stability fund will use these trench financial products with risk crunching as well, but we will move with a couple of hundred K or a couple of million at a time. And then for me to pay like $500, $400, I, I, and get 20% interest or 10% or even 5% in interest rates. Yeah. That that is worth it for me because like the security is more important for me. The security and trust is more important for me than the uh, transaction costs, right? So if I have it on Binance Smart Chain or any other chain that is still gives me a little bit of headaches, uh, that will basically cost me more, right? So because yeah. stress and stuff. <laughs> But are you looking at different side chains or layer twos or? Yeah, of course. I mean, we, uh, this is something that we've been doing for um, a couple of years now, uh, all the way when, like uh, even at some point we were looking about potential integrations with, uh, you know, blockchains that now don't, um, yeah. not that they don't exist, but now that they're not considered top tier. Like basically now you have people talking about Avalanche in 2017, you had people talking about NEO. Um, so, so that's not to draw comparisons between the two, but, but basically what I'm saying is that uh, Ethereum has been there uh, and pioneered a lot of the innovation that's happening. But you have stuff like Solana, which is, which is, which is becoming quite interesting. Uh, yeah, so we, we always keep an open mind. We, uh, we look at different... Uh, uh, different types of blockchains. So far, EVM compatible seems to be, Ethereum virtual machine compatible seems to be uh, the most popular. Um, I'm not too sure about Binance chain uh, because like if I'm using Binance chain, I'll just use a centralized entity and that's that's pretty much uh, does the same, same purpose. Uh, no, that's not to take anything away from Binance chain. I think the marketing that they've done, the the you can't say the tech because it's all all from Ethereum. Even the products that are built on Binance Chain are copies of what's there on Ethereum. But like I don't look at it this way. Uh, I read something the other day and I mentioned it to you that a rising tide lifts all ships, yeah. right? I don't see it as competing with another uh, projects that that's doing tranche uh, an offering similar to tranche and i don't see ethereum necessarily competing with binance chain uh, it's competing for the current set of users fine but that is less than one percent of the whole world so uh yeah a rising tide lifts all ships and that's that's the thought process that everyone in, in crypto in my opinion should have i i completely agree with that um what I am worried about a little bit, and I think we need to push very hard for this also in the community and to our you know, investor and networks, that um, what you see hap happened with the internet when Yahoo and Google came, although nice, uh, and we still use it, but it, this, it did like centralize also parts of the internet. So we, I, in my opinion, we do need to watch out with that, but uh, it is also very good because it will onboard more people into DeFi and into blockchain networks in general. What I find very interesting, I would like to hear your opinion on this. In this new, in this super cycle, and right now in this bullish, more bullish cycle, do you see um, uh, also now the, the people that are staking? It, it seems to me like if I look at the data, if I look at a lot of custodial data and stuff like that, it's like in 2017 it was the bull, it was the market for the retail, right? A lot of retail money. Now it seems that there is a lot of institutional money at play already in the market. And the retail is still very, it's relatively much smaller than in 2017, I think. Oh, it's definitely less than 2017 in terms of retail adoption. Like I, uh, internally in the company, we have like a, a metric of uh, how many of your non-crypto friends actually reached out about it versus how many people that work in investment banking reached out. 
So yeah. now yeah. what we're seeing is that uh, the shift has moved from uh, my barber asking me about uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum to someone that works uh, in a top uh, investment bank asking me uh, the difference between Uniswap and SushiSwap, which I think it's, it's, it's uh, when I was telling, I, I'm a big fan of both Uni, Uniswap and SushiSwap. Uh, and I've, I've been telling people about it a lot and bankers find it very hard to uh, take something called sushi swap seriously. I'm like, if you don't take it seriously, you're going to be left behind. Like, don't, don't care about the name, it, the functionality and what they're doing is actually pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, to, to answer your question, I do think that, uh, look, in crypto, Bitcoin is like the bear, uh, flag bearer. It carries the torch and everyone else is more or less following. That's, that's the reality of it. So after we saw Tesla, after we saw MicroStrategy, after we saw uh, listed companies add Bitcoin to their uh, balance sheet, it became normal for a CFO to tell his boss or tell his board, hey, listen, we want to do X, Y, and Z in crypto. Because if you said this two years ago, the board would have said, are you crazy? Like, wh what type of risk are you taking? But now you can comfortably say that, yeah, just look at Tesla's uh, filings with the SEC. They purchased $1.5 billion uh, worth of crypto. So you can't ignore it anymore. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's so interesting to see how some bankers uh, basically still try to avoid it, especially in the Middle East. Uh, and then you see some other bankers that are saying, you know what, this actually can have potential. Uh, and they're embracing it. So uh, the difference between a, a, a non-coiner and a, and a Bitcoiner is, is becoming more and more apparent uh, as time passes. Yeah. And we're, we're building the bridges. I think like uh, Slice and DeFi Capital and like my, in my channel and, you know, everything. We're, we're, we're all about building bridges and, and collaborate to see if we can solve uh, some you know, capital efficiency issues uh, that we're facing right now in the world. And I think it's very important for us to to do so, to uh, increase our, uh, our our wealth. And at the beginning, I think, you know, it's all about financial inclusion and, and, and et cetera. But in the beginning, it just, it moves to the edges of the network. So meaning that also maybe some smaller players normally would not get that much uh, capital will actually gain a little bit more. And I think, uh, yeah, that's adoption that we need to see. So that means that we need to, uh, chase some some middle to medium sized companies that will adopt these new uh, capital efficient more efficient uh, workflows and they will then outcompete some of the very bureaucratic big machines right i think that's uh, that's Agreed. probably the way to go all right uh, so that is a lot of very very cool information so yeah, I, I want everybody to to visit the the app.tranche.finance to to check out the pools and to uh, read the documentation and try to understand what you guys are trying to build. Maybe you can explain a little bit because I know at all you you're building a lot of things still on the roadmap. Uh, the, the space is moving at a crazy speed. So what is the most exciting thing uh, you're building at this point uh, on the on the roadmap? Or what is the most exciting thing that you see in the roadmap? Uh, Oh man, that's 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 actually a very good question. So for us as a company, we previously did the mistake of doing too many things. We were developing an Ethereum wallet, a block explorer, a node, something called JTicker for price feeds, and yeah. we spread ourselves too thin. We were excited, yeah. we were naive. Now we have learned from that mistake, and we're basically we have a very ambitious roadmap uh, where we basically want to uh, become the best protocol for managing risk on chain and, and uh, your ability to create all sorts of exotic structured products that you can't even think about in traditional finance. Uh, but actually, we're, we're, we're uh, sharing a, a public roadmap with the community uh, this week. And first off, we are doing tranches for compound uh, bearing instruments, so C tokens. After that, we will have Aave tokens. Um, and then after that, we will be launching the tranche DAO, which I'm very excited for because I do think uh, the next wave in crypto will be focused on DAOs and, and, and seeing how these autonomous organizations can invest, spend, etc. cetera, um, and then kind of creating financial statement equivalents for those DAOs. 
because I do think that they'll be uh, marginally more, actually not marginally, exponentially more efficient than traditional institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, basically that's, uh, and then finally the golden goose would be uh, getting traditional financial institutions and traditional financial assets into our uh, DeFi protocol. So that's, that's something that not uh, many people have, or I don't think anyone has uh, solved uh, fully. So for now, we will focus on uh, the tranche product with C tokens and then A tokens from Aave, tranche DAO, and then after that, uh, we will capitalize on the work, the hard work we did the past couple of years in, in the tokenized asset space to uh, kind of marry those together. <clears throat> yeah, that sounds amazing. And I think <clears throat> if I hear it like this, I think the, if the DAO is launched and... Um, you know, also DeFi Capital will join the DAO. I am personally joining the DAO, but <clears throat> of course, no investment advice. But what we can decide then as a DAO is basically when we see one of your, you know, connections that you, you are basically talking to them, the DAO can basically drop them some tokens to actually explore the network, you know, like, yeah, I mean, crazy things like that can, can happen. It's basically like, um, it's maybe a little of a negative word, but I think we, we can vampire attack the traditional financial space and, you know, put some, out some liquidity to uh, these new protocols that we're building uh, instead of like, you know, wasting money in their uh, in their traditional financial protocols. And I think Ripple uh, kind of, you know, I don't really like Ripple. I think it's it, it makes no sense, their token and stuff. But what they showed very well is that you can have these big people listen if you pay them money. So it's, it's a very, <laughs> right? Yeah. It, Ripple just paid tokens and then implemented also cool technology. And I think DAOs, I, I'm part of MakerDAO as well. And I hope to become also part of the Trench Financial DAO uh, as well. And then uh, be a voice there. And then, you know, if we see a company in your network, hey, look, this company, let's talk to them. And then we just, you go in and you say, well, here, I have 5,000 uh, uh, euros uh, for you in tokens. Uh, it's waiting for you to claim it. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the condition of the claim is that you need to do a proof of concept with us. And then it's like, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very uh, novel and interesting way of aligning the incentives between the investors, the protocol, and the users. Uh, and that's something that I think Compound uh, started with their liquidity mining, distributing comp tokens to whoever is borrowing and lending. Uh, and yeah, so basically we're, we're planning to do a combination of that as well as having like a financial DAO that actually manages uh, real funds, um, most of which were, or like it was kickstarted by the donation Gibril did to the tranche DAO. Yeah, that is a very cool um, way of doing things. And oh yeah, and the last thing that we, we didn't talk about is so basically the Gibral network, which is basically a consulting company, is just a for-profit and actually positive cash flow company at this point, right? Yeah, so um, basically Gibral's mandate is to uh, develop uh, tranche.finance. So that's that's the core uh, focus of the company. Initially, it was uh, Gibral network, but since, the, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, the product market fit wasn't fully there, the idea is... Uh, to utilize uh, its resources to further develop tranche.finance and then get the work that been, that's been done on the tokenized asset space to be to become part of that. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, that is amazing. So it's basically a, a share in a DAO that, that is um, going to go, that still has a long way to go. And I think what, what I see, like, uh, let's hope it's earlier, but I think we're, we're now in the super cycle and I think we're, we're, we're all building and the amount of interest and phone calls that I get from people that I didn't hear of for some time is, is insane. Uh, and as you said, also mostly from corporates, et cetera, that are just reaching out now. Let's go, guys. We want to we want a piece of this. Um, that will come now. And I think we're going to probably to like maybe 100K, 120K Bitcoin and seven, eight K ether, but then we will see another big crash. And then it's time for, you know, the core uh, protocols like, like trench finance uh, or like Aave or like compound or Uniswap to keep on building and then be ready for the next super cycle because that, that it's just in cycles. Um, but it's, I don't know how it's going to play out this time because 
so much institutions are involved and they don't really care about like a 20, 30 percent price drop because they're in it for 10 years, right? So it's like very hard, very hard to see what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I personally buy the dips, uh, but that's again not investment advice. No. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think yeah. the, 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 let's say the uh, impact or no, the, the, the strength of the cycles will drop over time because people can more or less anticipate it. Like you, I know, were expecting this uh, super cycle and then drop, but yeah. newcomers might not have the same experience that you or other people that have been in crypto for a while would have. Uh, but as people become more aware, like in the next happening, I'm not sure we'll see as much of uh, a standard deviation. Uh, but yeah, again, no one really knows. Like some of my friends were telling me, you know, yeah, you know, March is a bear market for crypto. I'm like, but how many marches have you experienced in your lifetime as a crypto investor slash trader? You know, just because it happened last year doesn't mean it's going to happen this year or next year. Um, yeah. Last March was crazy because we had that insane flash crash on bitmex uh so yeah it's, <laughs> yeah i can tell that brings back uh, memories yeah it's very stressful times at some point yeah. so that's why you know risk crunching is the way to go you know like and i'm very happy with these risk crunch products um gets out a little bit of the stress uh, that we normally have i guess right <laughs> agreed agreed all right. Hey, Tahal, thank you. Do, is there any last words you want to announce or any last things you want to, to mention before we, we leave? Uh, no, but I'd love to get anyone's uh, input, feedback. We, uh, we're we always open to, to, to uh, input from community members. Uh, reach out to us on uh, Discord. The, the team and myself are pretty active there. Um, and yeah, thanks. thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was very insightful. I learned a lot about real world assets and I, I, I love this uh, in-depth conversation. We're definitely going to do, uh, do this uh, again once, uh, you know, once you have uh, world domination and uh, once you get like, <laughs> mass, mass adoption. Now I'm in between as well, uh, of course. Amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, if, definitely need to do one in between before we dominate the world so that we have constant checkpoints. Yeah. yeah, let's hope there's time. Let's go so far <laughs> now, but that, that, that will happen. Yeah, we will do that. Um, yeah, I will drop all the links down below, as, as Tahal said, uh, Discord, Telegram, uh, all the, you know, all the standards uh, links that you can use to uh, get engaged into this new ecosystem uh, Yeah, and start working. When the DAO goes live, do you also have like uh, some bounties or things like that for people? Yeah, to yeah. actually, my colleague Gala is working on a bounty program as we speak. So uh, that's that's also in the pipeline. That's perfect, right? So I love bounties and I, I think it's a very cool way for uh, people that are maybe new to the space or like maybe some developers because what I also see some very professional people just like thinking like, hey, let's take a look at this space, do some bounties. It's a lot of fun, you know, even if it's translation or uh, some small developer task uh, that you can do. I highly encourage also to help out on that uh, regard. Yeah, and take a look at trench finance and also uh, as of course being said i i also am, am part of the curve finance DAO, of the maker DAO, of 88 miles per hour DAO, and it's all lego blocks that are all putting different pieces of this amazing big puzzle together so take a look at that and uh yeah i hope to see you in the next uh, in the next video guys and thank you very much for watching and if you have any questions drop them down below for the whole or if you want me to cover any other topics please uh comment below and subscribe to the channel and like uh, that will help to get more people to view this uh, content thank you very much guys and see you in the next one thank you thank you amadeo